Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you for the bio break. I needed it. I was wrapped up today. <laughs> I was wrapped up. Today. That panel was amazing. Um, amazing. I'm going to use some of my older uh, reform Black Protestant um, churches. Churches, I'm going to say I got fed and I was definitely at church today. So thank you particularly uh, what Lubna shared with me, um, stripped down of all its pretense. Um, yeah, I've been humbled since October 7th, particularly being in community with folks. Um, it's something. It's something. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Yeah, that was really incredible. Um, I just want to welcome all the panelists. Um, if they want to um, jump on um, the screen with Tiffany and I, um, that would be really great. We, are, we have um, structured and unstructured section of this panel, Letters for Palestine. And I guess one of the things that we can share, um, in addition to some poetry, um, I'm, we're thinking a lot about June Jordan's um, poetry for Palestine. Um, maybe we could share a little bit about how this event came to be, because um, I think that becomes such an important um, marker of like transparency in our community about how we, how do we build to get to these moments? How do we, and I think some of the the questions that we got in the chat were like, how do you move forward in the midst of so much, right? So much horror, so much trauma, despair. Um, and so I don't know, do you wanna do you wanna share a little bit about how how we came to this? Yeah, um, one, it's through knowing you, <laughs> number one, um, and wanting to be in community with you and know you better and inviting you to be a part of the Black and Indigenous Feminist Futures Institute's um, collective, right? And so, and that is, to be completely transparent, a Mellon-funded project. Mellon um, actually solicits proposals. You don't just apply. So that is also a closed settler colonial kind of formation that we're also using for other kinds of work. So some of those networks um, made this possible. Um, for sure. Um, and using some of those tools, I'm thinking of Audrey Lord, who's up here, <laughs> right? Breaking some of the tools. So our networks and then doing um, work with you, having you conceive of this vision and then being able to meet Iman, who is an amazing pedagogue and teacher, I think stand-up comedian too, who yeah. actually... Yeah, did a training for some colleagues who are part of my chapter of Faculty for Justice for Palestine to help us um, teach Palestinian liberation, right? To teach about uh, resistance struggles um, at this particular phase of Palestinian uh, resistance in our classrooms and how to build community um, with not just faculty, but students who are committed to this. I know uh, next week, uh, we have some students on campus who are incredible, fierce organizers who are doing Palestinian Liberation Week um, along with other campuses. And so to really build community and do the very work that folks on uh, the last panel were talking about, right? Um, so yeah, it's our origins to trying to create these formations to think about diaspora, right, um, and solidarities in our own work and thinking about how we use philanthropic dollars. So that's real and that happens, yeah. For sure. I mean, for me, it's really incredible to be able to work with you. And I think this kind of move of working as two people who are like, just to be transparent, are in these institutions, but don't come from these institutions um, generationally. Um, I think our, our, our struggle is to find a way to do things differently um, to do things um, that are much more committed to our communities ethically and politically. And I think that becomes important. I know um, I had the honor of being with Iman, who I don't, Iman, I, I mean, you've been on camera the whole time, so you don't have to, yeah, but right. Iman, I love you. And I just want to give you your flowers. Um, sure. uh, and here my dog's just <laughs> acting a fool. Um, but I wanted to say that I had the opportunity to overlap with Iman for a year um, at Cornell University when we were at the Society for the Humanities. And it was a really beautiful experience um, getting to know Iman and, you know, building community with Iman. Um, and when, you know, we, while we were there together for the year, we, we, we talked about a lot of things and shared a lot of things. And we know that, you know, we have this current, um, crisis and concern and catastrophe around Palestine, but we know that this has been ongoing 
and this is decades, and it kind of feels like it's a revisiting over and over again um, of this kind of settler colonial catastrophe um, that affects us all in, in multiple ways, right? Um, differently, and I think that's important. Um, so in after October 7th, I know that we, and, and I think this is like a moment to be really transparent about the police of Centro and my new role there is coming in as director, you know, the first woman to be permanent director of Centro, first black woman there um, mm -hmm. from the diaspora, all of that uh, becomes really important. But like thinking, what is Centro's role here? What do we do? What do we say? And how do I attend to this knowing that I'm the only tenured professor in the entire staff of Centro? It, when I when I speak, I am protected, but no one that, that works for me at Centro is protected in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the role that we do? And so I, you know, remember talking to my staff and, and saying like, I wanna make sure we want, I wanna put out a statement. I wanna, you know, let's do this. Um, and they were so beautiful, but beautiful about it and, and committed to it. And then um, I was talking to my, to my colleague um, Jessica Johnson, who runs the DSL with me, which is also a Mellon funded project. Um, and Jessica was like, well, you put a statement. Do you know if all of your staff also are in alignment with this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, this is this is really important. And so this is when we put together a teaching. So we put in a teaching together for Centro and the DSL with Iman and Takuma Peters, leading it, thinking about the Palestinian struggle, the historical and political context of this, um, experience, right? Um, and then also, like, what is the Black radical tradition and what can it tell us about relationality in this moment and beyond this moment? Because it has to last, it has to be enduring. Mm -hmm. And it was there that we decided that we wanted to do more, right? We wanted to kind of bring something together. And as part of, you know, beefy and, you know, talking about like, let's, let's think about doing something. I was just so honored that you were so open that I was like, what about this idea? And you were like, yes, let's go. Yes. And then, you know, <laughs> Puerto Rican Studies Association was like super down for it. And then the NYU Latin uh, project, Arlene Davila, like sent me a message and said, hey, can we put together a teaching? And I was like, I just put together a teaching, but like, here's some folks that could do a teaching and then we're going to do this other thing. And if you want to participate. So that first kind of meeting was really exciting because all of these different folks and Iman coming in from the Palestinian feminist collective and saying like, yes, we can do this. And this is how for me was really critical to think about what are some of the ways that we can do this where we put ourselves um, on the line um, and, but also use ourselves to, to help protect others who might not have, right? Like the capability or our actions can detrimentally impact others. How mm -hmm. do we deal? And that, that has been, that has been really like um, incredibly difficult for me as a person politically and as a leader. Like this is like a new a new moment, right? Um, but when we were talking about what to name this um, mm -hmm. event, and we were like, you know, I remember one of the oh the inter intersectional whatever blah blah blah. But it was like known, and we started to think about you know the poetry of Audre Lorde, right? What does it mean for us to be at the edge of each other's battle, right? Like what does it mean for us to be able to share in a place? the kind of overlapping histories of our dispossession, of enslavement, of genocide, historical and ongoing. And to say like, I see you, right? And like, as um, as Cristina Olivares says, like love is the enduring, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm thinking about Audre Lorde's poetry, which I posted a few times here um, in the chat at the beginning, like one part of it, she says, we have chosen each other and the edge of each other's battle. The war is the same. If we lose, someday women's blood will congeal upon a dead planet. If we win, there is no telling. We seek beyond history for a new and more possible meeting, right? And for me, that really encapsulates so much about like the impetus for this. And I, I don't think that we knew what, what could happen, right? What would happen in this event. But what we do see is something really incredible in the two panels that we just had with all of these folks coming together to meet and to conceive of what it means to speak to each other across that shared difference of experience, you know? Mm -hmm.
No, absolutely. And um, Casey, who is in Honolulu right now, and also Sonia, who's on her way, I think, to Baltimore, couldn't be here today, but they're my co-directors from Beefy. And we're like, oh, no, this is us. And this is the time we're supposed to meet. And this is the struggle we're supposed to be engaged in. And it just really... Um, deepened our resolve that the work that we wanted to do as Black and Indigenous feminists to challenge what the settler state, um, the settlement of uh, the University of Virginia that we're on, which is still a plantation and has all of its plantation artifice up, <laughs> right, and artifacts. Um, no, we need to be doing this because there's a way that, again, I just want to um, lift up and celebrate the way that Melanie Yazi brought the fire this morning. There is a certain kind of clarity that the resistance, the ongoing resistance in Palestinian um, Palestine is making very... Um, concrete and palpable for us as Black and Indigenous feminists, that we actually need to crash the U.S. settler state, which has incredible reverberations and literally strangles the tentacles um, that are reaching into the Israeli state. So it's like, no, our resolve to struggle with each other is actually... Um, we're recommitted to it in a different way with a different kind of energy. And I do want to say that coming into this university um, around the time of October 12th has changed the way I relate to people. I mean, just thinking about Lubna, I'm not I'm not looking for the scarcity and the conflict and the tension. Like, I don't have time for it. I don't have the energy for it. I'm trying to really wide, ride the wheels off of these institutional resources um, and go for broke and go for broke. People's lives are on the line, right? And so even I feel you about at one point feeling protected, you know, Myra, certainly with tenure, um, but also that protection is, is tenuous, right? Um, we don't always have it, right? And so, um, you know, I'm sure that you've been snitched on to the administration about the content in your courses. That has been something that has happened for me. And I don't know what our administration is going to do, right? I know the work that I have been doing. I know the work that I've committed myself to, and I'm going to continue to do the work, right? Particularly when you're someone who has been doing this work, why stop? Why stop? Mm -hmm. Why stop? So no, thank you for the invitation. And of course, we're going to show up and we're excited to and excited to see where this is going to lead. Yeah. And it was so also I have to give a shout out to my incredible students in transnational feminisms uh, 3125, who also developed their own playlist inspired by uh, the playlist, the Spotify channel of um, this particular event and the Palestine Feminist Collective Spotify channel. So I really appreciate y'all for that. And it has been a pleasure to teach them this particular semester, the ways that they are growing um, interpersonally. I have um, folks who are part of Students for Justice in Palestine, folks who are going home, um, Jewish students who are talking to their parents, like people are stretching and changing in ways that are profound, that are absolutely profound. And we get to experience that in real time. So um, yeah, this is an incredible moment. And let's continue to think about what we can do together. I would love to continue to collaborate. And students, you got to actually hear from Melanie Yazzie, whose uh, collective work is a part of the Red Nation, Communism is the Horizon, Queer Indigenous Feminisms is the Way. Um, yes, Melanie Yazzie was on here. You did uh, see her as well as Iman Ghanayam and members of the uh, Palestinian Feminist Collective whose Palestine is a Feminist Issue we read uh, and talked about this week. So um, I'm full. I'm full. This has been fantastic. Thank you again. Yeah, I mean, when when Iman came to do the um, the teaching with Tukuma, we talked about what are the possibilities of doing uh, of action, right? In addition to the action that we you know when we go to the street, we're writing letters, we're doing right, like we're writing to our representatives or whatever it is that we're doing, right? We're sending aid, we're doing all these things, and one of the things that um, Iman had suggested, and the reason why this panel is called Letters for Palestine is because Iman said, you know, maybe there is a possibility for folks to write letters. Maybe folks want to, you know, folks in Palestine are, are, are reading. They might want to hear your messages of solidarity, maybe your experiences, right? There was a moment in the teaching kind of similar to this where it was just a time for the people to, to share and to think through 
um, both their uh, political commitments, but also to learn and unlearn the things that they have been told about each other, right? Um, and it was really powerful. There was like a lot of tears. Um, and I think that that was um, really important. I remember, and I don't know how many of folks here that are attending, um, you know, are, have, you know, parents who are engaging this or grandparents or family members that are engaging this in radically different ways, right? And how do we, how do we step into our families how do we step into our communities? How do we attend to this and to the disinformation and misinformation that people have been getting? For me, very early on in October, I remember like going to visit my mother and her husband were watching the news. And I talked about this with folks. They were watching the news and uh, Spanish language news is super conservative, right? And seeing a particular kind of, um, you know, US filtered, uh, version of what's happening in Palestine um, and I had to sit with both of them and kind of translate back and forth and give them like a crash course history on what's going on and I remember my mother's husband um, saying like you know after after regurgitating to me what he had seen in the news being like well of course well of course they're, they're tired of living like this of course they're you know they're gonna they're gonna you know fight for their freedom and it, all it took was like a 10 15 minute conversation to kind of be like wait follow me, come with me, listen, let's talk a little bit about what this can look like, you know, um, what this actually is outside of what's being told to you. And I think part of that is so much of the work we have to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much of the work. It is like talking to our families, talking to our neighbors, and especially across languages and experiences, right? So that kind of very quick, like, let me translate Palestinian history in 10 minutes to these like 70 plus year old people in Spanish, right? Like, and like, I just don't want them to go and hit the streets and go talk to their friends and be playing dominoes and regurgitating what they're seeing because part of that is teaching and and engaging and being patient. Like, oh, it's not the role for everybody, right? That patience, once you hear something that, you know, automatically your like knee-jerk reaction is like, that's ignorant, that's wrong, that's mm -hmm. colonial, that's what, and so you can go come in and just like machete left and right, right? Um, everybody. But I think part of it is the patience, right? The kind of way to like, you see it and then you have to recalibrate. How do I reach this person? How do I how do I talk to them? How do I translate this so that it's in a way that is like capacious enough for you to understand it, but also in a way that doesn't see me, you like, you don't see me as you like just knocking me down all the time, right? Um, and I mean, I don't think that's the, that's the, that's the role for everyone to play, nor is it the approach that we should have with everyone. Some people don't deserve that much grace, you know, <laughs> but I think it's an important part of our work, you know, in the world in doing this. If we really believe in it, it's, it's that kind of conversation, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to um, remember who it might've been Melanie Yassi again, who was saying liberalism makes things complicated, right? Liberalism does a lot of acrobatics, black flips, um, splits, right? To make you think this is a more complex issue than it is. And then what I found out also talking to my kin and my family and my parent, right, is people who have actually experienced colonialism, know what that feels like materially in the body, right? Know how that structures a household, makes you go without, kind of get it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm also amazed like many of the panelists for um the first session this morning were like oh no like the ways people have been to organize been able to organize and respond to this like within a five-month period is unlike anything we've ever seen and i'm noticing that with my own kin there's a a recognition right and also no we're seeing this real time live all the time right um particularly on people's igs people are recording a genocide they're experiencing, right? And folks, you can't ignore that, right? So um, that's also a way that we can energize movement work for sure, for yeah. sure. And yeah. you know, I think so many folks want to lean into the like, it's complicated, it says, and as in our first panel, um, it, it was made really clear, it's actually not complicated. All you need to do is like peer into it one second. It's not complicated at all, right? Um, part of that is being able to bear witness, right? And then the other thing that I'm thinking is that sometimes this work can feel solitary. Part of the work is talking about it and being able to share because you can start, your mind starts to play tricks on you, right? Your mind, you just start to be like, hey, you know, is this really happening? This can't be happening. Like, right, how do I, 
how do you stay sharp? How do you stay attuned? How do you say, uh, you know, your ability to say adapt um, and to kind of continue to work in it when it becomes so overpowering? I remember going to the Black Studies Collaboratory uh, Black Features Retreat, and th there was a whole section of it that got completely um uh, uh, we shifted gears, right? Because it was it was happening. It was right in in October, right? Early like late October, early November, and all we could talk about in this retreat, like the agenda had to be scratched, and it was about Palestine and about what our role is. And so there was an altar, and there was a circle, and the, there was a lot of children there, and there was a lot of caretakers, those radical caretakers in Oakland, um, that were there with the children, and the children did like um a march mm -hmm. at the place that we were staying in, and the kids like were activities, and they started like doing their protests at the kind of hotel, you know, um, mm -hmm. at the same time that all the parents and all the adults were like sitting and having like an organizing meeting. And I remember thinking about what does it mean for me as someone who's like a relatively new mother um, and thinking about those moments of like holding my own child, you know, after October 7th and weeping, right? And weeping, imagining all of the people, uh, all of the women, the families, the men, the communities in Palestine who are losing their children, unaid, burying their children, right? What does it mean to have me, a Black woman colonial subject, to even have the privilege to hold my own son, right, Um, in this moment? It just is like, it It expands the mind into these places where you just, it becomes so disorienting, right? And part of the colonial project is a disorientation. It makes you uh, have, like, in what the talks about, like, a lack of belief um, that you can, that you have the right to struggle, right and that your struggle is worthy and that then you start to kind of just like it's just all of this it's like really it's really a mind fuck right um this kind of uh, ongoing non-stop violence but then there is that beauty of the non-stop ongoing resistance to it right like it's just it just doesn't stop and it's and so part of that is like tapping in yeah. to that so that you don't lose track right so that you don't begin to believe that there is no other possibility and part of that is also leaning into our like foremothers right and their actions and their political commitments because they showed us a path and they showed us a way to think about this work and so that we don't have to feel like even though we have new technologies right so we can like record things we can see them we can make them available and visible the actual fundamental strategy of bearing witness to one another and being in solidarity with another through action right um, it's something that we have already seen as a pattern that was made for us. And yeah. so we get into that helps us out, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I was just reflecting on um, just the folks that I have been assigning as a teacher, right? Like way back when I first started teaching, like I always started my Black Feminist Thought course off with um, June Jordan's Intifada, right? We just out the box started with that, just to think about the scope of Black feminist struggle, right, and the Black feminist political imagination. Um, interestingly enough, <laughs> I have this playlist that I'm going to share with you all. I'm going to copy what it was 12 students compiled, three songs, and they gave a rationale for why they suggested the songs to add to the playlist. Uh, Solange's big sister did make it, I don't really see it for her. We're going to have to talk about that in class next week. But I mean, as, as much as we're seeing a particular kind of unified front, there are conversations we have to go back and have in some of our feminist camps and realize we're not all the same kind of feminists, right? And so <laughs> rubber hits the road in some interesting places, right? Around that. Um, but also just like thinking with Lubna, like my level of compassion and patience with myself and with other people um, is different. It's different. Um, there's a way that I can hold space more. And that is directly due to struggling with people and building community with people, right? Um, and the places it takes you, the trust it builds, the way you got to hold people when other people are taking risks that you won't, when you're taking risks that other people won't, that this is a profound moment for us, right? And we need to dig in and go harder, right? I um, There's something, I'm not saying that I am reckless or without fear. I'm someone who quite honestly, to be transparent, I don't have kids. Um, I do have elders in my life that I have to take care of. I have a partner um, who does the same gig that I do. But if we do lose this job and I do, 
um, we'll figure out something else. We'll figure out something else, right? And that's a particular clarity I have also from being in community with folks, right? Who are taking risks at the same time, right? Um, also something that, you know, my students taught me this um, week because I was struggling with, um, sometimes we, and we discuss this about transnational feminisms when there's a tension to over there, um, the metropole or a particular kind of colony, um, when the when U.S. feminisms do the transnational, we always displace the violence. There's something about the relationship between the U.S. and Israel that we always have to come back home. It's here, right? It's here. This is where empire and the Israeli settler colonial state gets its formation, right? It's here. It's Europe. It's Great Britain. So we have to struggle to crash things here. And my students were very, very clear about this. We have to struggle for indigenous sovereignty right here on Turtle Island. Like there's, there's no way around it. And there's no looking past it at this particular moment, right? It, it's impossible to do that because you can set your eyes squarely on the U.S., right? All the weapons they're shipping all the dollars they're shipping and the way that they're funding this genocide and apartheid, right? Absolutely free Hawaii too. We we're just reading Hee Hee Hobart's Cooling the Tropics in mm -hmm. Transnational Feminisms. Absolutely, right? And so folks, the youth are getting it. <laughs> the youth are getting it. And so um, that's something that really, really um, strengthens me and inspires me. And they also, I guess, have a certain grace for Solange's sister too that I just don't have. I don't, maybe they're working on talking to her, but I just, <laughs> I got beef with her on the list, but yeah. We'll, we'll talk. You, 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 got, you got beef with her and like, is, is it on your list for today or what? No, no, no. It was, uh, it made the playlist for a couple of Oh, it made the playlist. Like, I just, oh, I don't okay, understand. For the playlist. I don't really have to like, talk about ooh, that. I would be like, Tiffany, tell me what's on your heart because okay, I don't know, I don't know where it came from, but it came from the playlist. Okay, got you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, That's no, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking about um, what is it? You know, I, there would, you know, there's all of these. How do I say this? You know how sometimes when you are with like like-minded folks. You're like, yes, we are like on this. We believe this. We know this. We're working on this. And then you encounter other folks and you're like, excuse me, what? Right? Um, in both in multiple directions, what? Right. So one, it's like people who are diametrically opposed to your politics, and you're like, whoa, excuse me, that's bananas, right? And then you encounter people who are like, I I remember encountering um, I was in um a car service and it was a Palestinian driver. And it was like, I init I immediately was like, I feel safe. Like, I feel really safe. But we were talking, it, I was in California, he was dropping me off. Um, and he was saying, like, we were there for Black Lives Matter, where, like, no one is speaking for us. Mm -hmm. Where are they here? And I was like, wait, what? Like, you you feel, you believe that? You, you, you really believe that? Or that's how you feel, you know? And he was like, yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like no one is speaking up for Palestine. And I was like, yo, I just came from a gathering of like 300 like black folks. And that's all we talked about for like four days, right? Um, and there was that moment that it was like, oh, you could be doing this work and you realize that maybe some people actually don't see you there, right? Like in the loneliness that is like colonial violence, what it what it what it creates and what it begets. Um, there's also these ways in which our own forms of solidarity um, and our own um, forms of witnessing actually don't reach everyone, right? So that it, it could be that um, we might really deeply believe in, in what we're doing and how we, we're feeling, but that might not be seen by everyone. And then it might be seen by people who see it as a threat and as dangerous, which it is, right? Um, and so that, that for me was like an eye-opening moment, which is like, how do we make sure like, you know, my, my issue is like, how do I, how do I prove to you? How do I show you? What can I do to show you that I care? Yeah. How can I reach you, you know? Um, and then I thought this person is actually probably not alone in thinking of this, right? What, what, how do we, how do we make these kind of broad connections? How do we engage in a kind of trust of one another, of those of us who are, you know, colonial subjects or former colonial subjects um, who are living through and fighting, right, um, through these horrific experiences, how do we, how do we reach each other across those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, that's been something that I've been thinking about. And I've also been thinking again of Iman's question of like letters for Palestine, right? About what what would we say if we could if we could speak to a family, um, a person, a child, what what would you say? Mm -hmm. them? And I actually would love to invite, you know, the attendees that are here, if they want to write like a short note in the chat, something that we can like um pull from, um, maybe even translate, get translated, um, and share. Uh, with folks in Palestine, what would you, what would you share? How would you, what, what is the kind of feeling that you have, the sense of struggle and commitment that you have, um, and how would you share that to someone? Mm -hmm. um, and then, oh, thank you, Charlene, the Dear Gaza, thank you for putting that link, that's amazing. Um, but I, I do want to give people a moment to think about that. And then um, Tiffany, I don't I don't know if you mind. Do you do you, maybe while people are thinking, should I read a poem by June Jordan? Oh yeah, that would be fantastic. I also I was thinking about um, that cab drivers. You were sharing that, and I'm thinking about um, like the landscape because I I live in Richmond and I live in North Church Hill or Nine Mile Road area for people who are familiar with Richmond that is um, historically black neighborhood still primarily black and there are the hugest murals like on the side of um, the T Mobile store um, the chicken joint of uh, the Palestinian flag right Palestinian liberation uh, movement shout outs uh, Free Palestine all over the place and working class black neighborhoods, right? Um, so one, just art, right? The incredible power of art, right? That someone took their time as a painter, a muralist um, to put that there, to make that visible for maybe someone whose gig is doing lift all day, right? Um, also, I love the idea of a playlist, like sharing signs, uh, so songs in particular, those are digital, right? And um, perhaps easy to access. So people's recommendations for songs as well, as well as messages, poems, right? Historically, Black and Palestinian people, Black and Indigenous people, Puerto Rican folks, Afro-Puerto Rican folks, we've been sharing poetry, right? We live for that. We live through it, right? Um, so again, the artists know how to make things shareable, right, in particular ways. But I just think about that particular mural and like bombing places <laughs> with murals, right? So folks do get to see it. But also, again, I'm thinking about um, mm -hmm. Lubna, like who's like, you know, in this struggle and seeing this particular kind of devastation, experiencing this loneliness, I have a particular kind of tenderness of heart where I'm not looking for scarcity. I'm looking for how people show up, right? And so um, that shifted me. <laughs> that shifted my whole day. That's going to shift me probably forever, Lubna. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. I really, I really do love that because I think um, part of the way that we come up especially in the u.s mm -hmm. through this very individualistic um world view and then also through the academy for those of us who are academics is you're always looking for the critical you're always looking for what is missing it's much harder to attend to what is there you know mm -hmm. um and so i really love that kind of reshifting of the mind which is actually yeah there might be a lack of solidarity in these in these places there might be a lack of commitment by these, these people but look at the beautiful overflowing amount of commitment and solidarity and work in struggle in this place, right? It's always easiest to go to the student in your classroom that is the least convinced by the pedagogy or by the content. It's always like, you might have like 39 students that are like, I love this class, this is the best ever, I love this content, I can't believe it. And then you have one student in the back, you know, that is like, mm. and you're like, all right, everybody, I don't care that you love this. I'm focused yeah. on you. Yeah. You are my target, right? Like, and so it's, you know, it's part of that, Kind of no switch actually put the love where the love is right grow where it's where there's growth right um so i think that that is really um potential you know one of the one of the things that i used to do i used to teach a class called um uh poetics of liberation and relation woman of color feminist thought right um and so we would do uh we would start uh every few class sessions with like um uh building a poem together so everyone would write a line and we pass it down 
across, right? And then we read it together. And it was really and beautiful to, to figure out where where we were going, right, with this and, and where was the feeling in the moment with these sets of readings. Um, that is also something that I'll be very open to do if anybody wants to be like a real hippie with me. You know what I'm saying? Like today, I'm I'm in it. But um, but yeah, but if we I, but I'm loving, by the way, I'm loving, I'm looking at all these comments and looking at folks as just a few sentences, right? That kind of commit into sharing videos and like all of these statements. I think this becomes really important, right? A testament and a commitment to what we're gonna do and how we feel and to be able to share that in public when it feels so scary to do so so many times, right? Feel like you're walking on eggshells half the time and then the other half of the time you feel real deep in your back because you know you're surrounded by people who believe the same thing. I just wanna like give space for that like lived experience of being out in the world every day in a place that is as torn as this, you know? So um, so yes, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so. Uh, June Jordan has this poem called Moving Towards Home. And um, obviously, we know June Jordan's deep commitment to Palestinian freedom. Um, and it starts with an epigraph called, Where is Abu Fadi? She wailed. Who will be my loved one? And this was um, quoted in the New York Times, um, September 20th, 1982. For me, this poem, Moving Towards Home, is it's a para los pelos, right? Like I, I get goosebumps um, thinking about how um, this is the kind of repetition, the palimpsest of colonization, um, how these words from 40 years ago could be so prescient for the moment that we're living in. So I'll read that now. If folks want to kind of write in however they're feeling, share how you're feeling. Um, and I'll read this um, for us. So moving towards home. I do not wish to speak about the bulldozer and the red dirt, not quite covering all of the arms and legs, nor do I wish to speak about the night long screams that reached the observation post where soldiers lounged about, mm -hmm. nor do I wish to speak about the woman who shoved her baby into the stranger's hands before she was led away, nor do I wish to speak about the father whose sons were shot through the head while they slit his own throat before the eyes of his wife. Nor do I wish to speak about the army that lit continuous flares into the darkness so that others could see the backs of their victims lined against the wall. Nor do I wish to speak about the piled up bones and the stench that will not float. Nor do I wish to speak about the nurse again and again raped before they murdered her on the hospital floor. Nor do I wish to speak about the rattling bullets that did not halt on that mean trajectory? Nor do I wish to speak about the pounding on the doors and the breaking of windows and the hauling of families into the world of the dead. I do not wish to speak about the bulldozer and the red dirt, not quite covering all of the arms and legs, because I do not wish to speak about unspeakable events that must follow from those who dare to purify a people, those who dare to exterminate a people, those who dare to describe human beings as beasts with two legs, those who dare to mop up, to tighten the noose, to step up military pressure, to ring around civilian streets with tanks, those who dare to close the universities, to abolish the press, to kill the elected representatives, of the people who refuse to be purified, those are the ones for whom we must redeem the words of our beginning. Because I need to speak about home, I need to speak about living room, where the land is not bullied and beaten into a tombstone. I need to speak about living room, where the talk will take place in my language. I need to speak about living room, where my children will grow without horror, I need to speak about living room where the men of my family between the ages of six and 65 are not marched into a roundup that leads to the grave. I need to talk about living room where I can sit without grief, without wailing aloud for my loved ones. Where I must not ask, where is Abu Fadi? Because he will be there beside me. I need to talk about living room because I need to talk about home. I was born a black woman 
and now I am become a Palestinian. Against the relentless laughter of evil, there is less and less living room. And where are my loved ones? It is time to make our way home. And that is Julie Jordan moving toward home. Sure. Were you making time to um, read and reflect on what people wanted to deposit or leave in the chat? Yeah. You want to do that? Yeah, I'm trying to see. I feel like I got the wrong box. <laughs> but no, absolutely. And I guess, again, lifting up all of the folks doing Palestine and Palestinian Liberation Week or Palestinian Solidarity stuff next week. I'm trying to follow as many people as possible. So um, I can not only support people, um, you know, get a sense of what's happening in real time with their struggles, but also like important resources, um, lessons and skill building uh, are shared there as well. So just want to lift up the people doing that organizing work. And um, yeah, I'm here to support next week on campus and other places. Um, I'm so sorry, uh, Ilmire. Can you help me out with the reading part? <laughs> I can. I'm going to start from the bottom. Um, so uh, Sarah Bruno put, we are each other's business, mm. are each other's magnitude and bomb from Paul Robeson by Gwendolyn Brooks. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's someone here that's written, every minute, this is Savannah, every minute, of every day my heart breaks open into fire for Gaza. I have such a rage, rage against the white supremacy machine that seeks to suffocate Palestinian dignity. My mama taught me that a free Palestine and a free Puerto Rico were already destined and done. And I take that as my work to do. Mm -hmm. um, Christian writes, the Palestinian liberation struggle is so personal to me as a Puerto Rican. The cry for freedom in Palestine is the same cry for, port for freedom in Puerto Rico. Since the outbreak of the invasion in Gaza, I have learned tremendously about the history of the Palestinian people. I've marched, I've fasted, I've learned to cook Palestinian soups. I've stopped using Amazon. I've closed my city bank account. At my church, we opened a monthly community, community dinners around prayers for, for Gaza and the West Bank. I've lost my job as an educator for connecting the climate crisis to the global wars for resources. Palestine will liberate us all. A world without Palestine does not exist. We are all Palestinian. Long live Palestine. Insha Akram says, I keep a pin on my bag, back and coat every single day. I remember Palestinian people in my prayers. I commit to continuous sharing of atrocities on social media. Keep fighting. Alex um, Lucia, Lucia says, I was burning a Santa Muerte candle in hopes it would send protection, sending e-sims, wearing the message and speaking the message. And Erica Jane says, I commit to teaching material on Palestine and supporting events on the conflict at my university. I also commit to returning to the OPT some way, someday if I can be of help. Mm -hmm. Takuma says, you will have walls, a home, your kin, your people, and your homeland once again. And it will be beautiful in the way that only a homeland can be. So are you seeing any of these, Tiffany, or no? Um, I haven't been reading along, because I'm sorry, I've been relying on you. If you want me to okay, no, okay. <laughs> I'm just like, my prescription ain't up to snow. <laughs> oh, I got you. I got you. I got your back. I got your back. I got your back. Yeah. yeah. Um. Therese says, um, I would give all my food to the families of Gaza who are starving. There is so much guilt I feel. Bree says, we've been having regular Palestine rallies on Sundays and they've been incredible coalition building spaces. Um, my um, Jesse Cornett says, my practice every day is to manifest for liberation for different peoples and lands. I spent 30 seconds, one minute and 30, uh, one point, 
one, you know, colon for 30 minutes, minute and a half. Sorry, I'm so losing it. <laughs> Focusing on what the liberation looked like. Palestine was the catalyst for this. I'd love people to know that I believe in my heart and I see it. Palestine is free. Palestine is healing. Palestine is thriving. Um, and then Claudia says, I wish I could share the weight of their pain, like literally feel part of their actual pain. I'm sorry for all of the time that I was ignorant on your struggle. I'm dedicating my life now to seeing Palestine free and rebuilt. Um, Ayat Ismail says, seeing the videos of Palestinians begging to be seen and heard. As a Palestinian, I see you. I hear you. My heart is with you. Um, Cheryl Lee says, Palestine is our present and we will keep fighting for their and our futures. And I want to say that I'm reading these because, you know, this event is being recorded and um, folks who see the recordings won't see your comments. Hmm. But I think that there should be a testament to the people who are here um, and to how you are feeling and what you are thinking in the moment. I think that's important. Um, to make space for that. Um, yeah. Um, what do you think, Tiffany? I love it. Thank you. I, I feel you. I see your response and I feel you too. Um, I, I would love to just make space if any of the panelists wanted to say anything, no pressure, but if <laughs> it was with something, no, y'all worked hard, particularly Iman, so um, that's fine, but Thank you for holding the space. Um, thank you to our co-sponsors, um, DSL, Diasporic Solidarities Lab, the Latinx Project, my own people, Beefy. Thank you, Michelle, our intern uh, who works with us. Of course, the Palestinian Feminist Collective. You give me my students life. Thank you for the analysis. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, thank you for um, thinking about that playlist. So um, that was like my students' favorite thing to do this week and they wanted to participate and contribute. Um, so thank you for touching us through song in that way. Also Central, thank you. We uh, look forward to working with you again, the Puerto Rican Studies Association, um, Touch Base. It's, I'm really, surprised at what kind of opportunities to engage in struggle become possible when you just get together, right? It starts with, for us, like a resolution to our faculty senate that we're discussing today that they're going to vote on, but it's also people taking individual actions um, to go to city hall to push for another divest resolution, um, and then taking other kinds of personal risks that I'm not going to put out here, but uh, get together and struggle with each other, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think anticipate in advance what's going to happen absolutely and I, I really do love thinking about like the gathering like there is I remind me of like Jackie Alexander is like you know when when women and women who are politicized politicized women of color come together there is no knowing yeah. right how they can shift the world um, and shift the way that they're doing and actually I was um, I was with um, Professor Jack Alexander about two weeks ago in Brooklyn. Uh, she was in in the country from Tobago, mm -hmm. and she shared with me something, and I, and I want to share it with you. I shared it with the DSL fellows a few weeks ago, but it's something that has really been uh, tripping me out. Um, and I think it's really useful for our panelists and for everyone that has been here today. And um, she said to me, "Your vision is too important to be compromised," mm -hmm. right? So when we're thinking about our vision for liberation, our struggle for decolonial politics and futures and presence, right? Um, I think that our collective vision is too important to be compromised by anything and by anyone, right? Um, and so I think that that is really, really important. And I want to say that, um, you know, you've been so grateful in like, um, 
in in recognizing the work of you know Centro Latinx Project, the Palestinian the Palestinian Feminist Collective, um, the Dash of Solidarities Lab. But I I want to say and I want people to know that BC really did shoulder um, so much of the kind of financial uh, cost of this event, if not all of it. Mm-hmm. That that is like you putting that kind of um, that funding to work to the end mm-hmm. of of illuminating all of these different dimensions of what Palestinian struggle and freedom is and can look like. And so like the Black and Indigenous Feminist features, um, I keep calling it an initiative, but it's an institute. Um, but it is so important, especially when we work together, because it was already Black and Indigenous, right? And we are also, you know, Black and Indigenous. And we are also thinking about what does that look like in all of these different contexts? And then bringing that those voices together, thereby fracturing, right, the kinds of um, silos that colonialism wants us to have. They want us to keep our struggles apart, right? Um, so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and I also want to thank my central team for like heeding the call and being on it. I mean, they just were so incredibly like organized and and committed and Kimberly, the events team and Tori, the communication team. I mean, everyone was just, you know, even behind the scenes, the preparation for for this, for the, you know, like even as we're organizing for this like beautiful moment of sharing, the preparation for any kind of violence to come into the space, right? Like Camacho and everyone else who, who stepped in and was like, yeah, we're doing this one, this is what we're gonna do. And, and so for me, I just feel so, um, so honored to be working with such an incredible team of people who who um put like their foot into every single thing and this is like nothing short of of what they you know what they usually do but there's something really special about them doing this so thank you mm-hmm. thank you yeah. them. thank everybody um and thank you all for being here yeah can, oh, can, can, I, can i add to the thanks thank goodness <laughs> you were bawling and I was like should I like interject but then I didn't like it should do, that would be rude you know they would be like this person has been talking for four hours and now that like these two women are talking she's still moderating no. she's oh, you know I we really should we, we should right. got to moderate this part too you know what I'm like <laughs> I was feeling your pain I was like oh I need to cry um uh yeah i mean i i think i just want to add to the gratitude um and one of my students sent me an email and said well mm-hmm. thank you so much for organizing this in the spirit of gratitude and i want to say that um you know i think that um i uh, i love you yumara to pieces and takuma who's also present you were all my family when my dad passed away in lonely ethica and I think that one of the things that we, and don't cry more. One of the things, actually do cry, do cry. <laughs> one of the things that we really miss out on is kind of the importance of friendship in how we um, do things. We are, I think the American, American culture and society is so sometimes fixated on grand gestures that they forget that the small things even have more, more ripple effect. You know, and so um, yeah. When when Yumara invited me to do the DSL teaching, I was like, you know what? I think you know we haven't had the chance to talk about, thankfully, to like really unpack the mindset behind Israeli settler colonialism. We didn't get to talk too much about colonialists and 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 and, and Zionists and and perpetrators of violence. We focus on ourselves, on what we do right, and how we resist. But I was going to say that the Israeli project, just like the American project, is an outcome of people um, bec- people migrating and people becoming diasporic, that sometimes mm-hmm. we forget that displacement does, um, um, is, it can germinate like violence mm-hmm. and, and, and isolation and, um, and thinking of ourselves as victim and as pain people, and there is something to be said about being in pain, but at the same time, not allowing ourselves to just be perpetual 
you know, suffering, um, vict victimized people. You know, I, I attended a panel recently where, where they said um, that the only, that the, that the kind of the currency of the Palestinian uh, people at the moment is suffering, that the only way through which people can hear us is if we suffer. To the extent that I see that internalized in my actions, if I am telling a sad story, people hear me out. If I'm telling a, not, a happy story, people hear me less. Mm. They want us to be sad and they want us to be suffering and they want us to be miserable. And they want us to be um, unable to um, regulate our emotions and deal with our burnout. And um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with that. And mm. I think that if any any kind of people are able to um, to put together a, a kind of intelligence and a kind of stamina to push through is diasporic people who are who are um, who who continue to be displaced. You know, I really like the framing, and the continuous framing of in the context of the United States, and it, like people think of um, enslavement se separately from indigeneity. You know, mm -hmm. people who are forcibly brought and 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 and, and um, shuttled throughout the world come from original places as well, and it's kind of like the grudge and the audacity to continue to separate people from their homeland and think that's okay and think somehow if you put them into somewhere else they're just going to lose that memory they're going to lose that body you know and so i think that um it is about time that we reclaim displacement as uh, not an excuse for violence as not an excuse for settler colonialism and patriotism and violent nationalism and to um, really hold each other in our pursuits to become back who we were and who we are, you know? I, I've i been doing Uber research a lot. <laughs> I, just, like, get into Uber. I get into these Ubers and I'm like, what's up with St. Louis? What's going on? What's happening <laughs> in this place? That's my okay. fault. And like people talk for for a while and I um I was in this Uber this week and I said I asked the same question and this amazing woman she was she was talking and talking and then she was saying you know what we need we need to become a village again and I was like I agree that's exactly what it is you we need to take care of each other and so um I will end my tangent right now <laughs> and just say that please, if you have any takeaway from this, to remember to be, um, for us all to pursue, to be um, the better virgins or the best virgins of ourselves and better friends and better kin. And to, um, uh, you know, not be, just kind of really, really fight the violence without and within. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Palestine is winning and we are winning. I mean, the, the cost is really, really high and it will never be compensated for justly. And we all know that. Um, it is within my spiritual and my religious faith to believe that there is gonna be justice. Um, and until that justice is seen and actualized, we will continue to hope for it. And um, a, last, a last thing to say that Free Palestine in Arabic actually translates to Philistine Hura, which is uh, an adjective of Tiffany Smiles, because I've mentioned that previously. And so it's also important for us to remember that nobody grants us freedom. We grant it to ourselves. Um, and we are free. If we are here and talking, we are. So yeah. I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you for the love. Thank you. <laughs> we are winning thank you for that thank you for those words weeks ago thank you for it now for sure love you love you all thank you all for being here